Hello, I'm Adam Lowenstein. Welcome to News in Depth, where each week we take a closer look at the stories and issues making news in Brevard County. On today's show, we'll hear from a top official with Brevard Public Schools about a vote tonight that could impact the jobs of hundreds of teachers and support personnel. We'll meet the people and discuss the factors behind current and future growth in the number of Hispanic-owned businesses on the Space Coast. And we'll rocket more than 200 miles above the Earth for a look at a big change coming for the International Space Station. But first up, it's time to get ready. Hurricane season starts its six-month run this Monday, and although it is still early, the time has come to start thinking about things you need to do to prepare your family and your home for these storms. We can help. Earlier today, I sat down with Bob Lay, Director of Brevard County's Emergency Management Office, to talk about what you can expect this storm season and how you can prepare. Here's our conversation. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration said last week that the odds favor a near-normal hurricane season. Their forecasters say there is a 70% chance of having 9 to 14 named storms, of which 4 to 7 could become hurricanes, including one to three major hurricanes in category three, four, or five. Bob, do you put much stock in forecasts like this? Well, actually, I don't worry that much about the numbers. What we tend to worry more about is uh, if the numbers are high, then, then we just look at it as, well, it looks like we've got a lot more work to do this year. We don't know where they're going, and that's really the important thing. If we knew or they knew where, the, where they're actually going, then we'd be great people. But we don't know that, so we really have to be prepared uh, this just says that we're still in this period of uh, very active hurricanes. Sure. Now, again, nonetheless, given the forecast accuracy or not, it's really essential that people prepare for these storms. Talk about the basics of a hurricane plan. Uh, you know, what should it include? Well, I think the, the very first thing any hurricane plan has to include is should you evacuate. And if you're living in an area at risk, if you live on the Barrier Island, if you live Merritt Island, uh, uh, satellite beach or, or any place that's at risk during a hurricane, then your plan has to include your evacuation. You should always evacuate for any category hurricane. Secondly, it has to include a communications component, and that component means that you let people, your loved ones in other states, know what you're doing and where you are. Now, again, you talked about those beachside places and elsewhere. Um, should everyone develop a plan, even if you're not living oh, too close to, in to Florida, water? In Florida, everybody needs to have a plan. Uh, I just mentioned those that are really at risk, and that's those right along the, uh, the ocean. Uh, however, if you're living on the mainland, you're, you also have some risk, and it depends on where you're living. If you're living in manufactured housing or if you're living in an uh, in apartment complex, yes, everybody's got to have a plan. A plan to stay in your home or a plan to evacuate from your home. Okay, sure. But you have to have a plan. Now, of course, it's no secret that the economy is struggling right now. People don't have a lot of extra money. Um, are there ways that... that, that folks can, can protect their personal safety, can, can protect their home, um, and do so inexpensively? Well, certainly, but, but there are right ways and there are wrong ways, and I'll tell you right up front, you can save money if you don't buy masking tape. Masking tape will not protect your windows at, at all, so people should never waste their time doing that. But you do have to protect your windows. So you, you can use plywood, which is an inexpensive way of doing that, and there are numerous uh, websites that give you the information you need for that. The main thing is that you need to have supplies on hand, and you can budget that during the whole year. So when you come into hurricane season, you, you've got the funds available to go ahead and, uh, and purchase those items that you need. Good. Now, uh, you talk about masking tape, and maybe that's not necessary. Talk about some other common mistakes you, you see people making before a storm, during a storm, and even after a oh, the, storm. I think the largest mistake is that waiting until the last minute. Uh, you can't do that because the shelves when you walk in a store will be barren, and you're going to hate yourself because you cannot live on, on just beer and popcorn during a hurricane. You've actually got to have stable uh, supplies on hand. Uh, other mistakes that people make is that they don't prepare their homes, they don't think it's going to be bad enough. The biggest mistake in this county that, that I know that people make is that they, they tell me I've lived through a category one, two, or three hurricane, and I have to think every time they've said that, that we haven't had a category one, two, or three hurricane, so how did they live through it in Bavard County? Okay, all right. So that's a huge mistake. Okay. Now, you talked about evacuations and the importance of that. Are there areas that you guys in emergency management are really focusing on or really concerned about 
as we head into the season, such as evacuation? Well, uh, yeah, and, and we look at all our shelters every year. We remeasure the shelters. We look at them and determine, is there a better facility that could be used as a shelter? We work very closely with Bavard County School Board with, uh, in doing this and with the uh, county government as well. So we've got uh, at least one or two new shelters this year. We've got two pet-friendly shelters. Uh, actually, we'll have, I'm sorry, we have three pet-friendly shelters this year. So we're taking pets more into consideration for those people that refuse to evacuate without taking their pet. We now have a place they can go to also. Good. Now finally, uh, I hear that you guys are sort of getting uh, with it a little bit and starting to use Twitter as a way to communicate with the citizens. Well, yeah, I, I guess we're really becoming hip or something, right. whatever the right word is. Uh, but we are, we are trying to use Twitter. We're trying to use everything possible to make sure that we can uh, get information out to the public. We really don't want the public to tweet back to us. We really just want the public to read what's going on and to have a good knowledge of when we call for evacuations and those kind of things. Good. Hurricane season begins June 1st and runs through November. My thanks to my guest, Bob Lay, Director of the Emergency Management here in Brevard County. Pleasure. Thank you. Of course, you can find plenty of additional information about preparing for the hurricane season at our website, floridatoday.com. And be sure to check out our series of how-to videos on a variety of hurricane preparation topics, from using a generator to navigating an emergency shelter. Now from storms to stores. Since 2000, the Hispanic population in Brevard County has nearly doubled, and now it represents more than 7% of the overall population here. Growing along with the Space Coast population has been the number of Hispanic-owned businesses. Nationally, those businesses are expected to grow nearly 42% in the next six years, and that growth is likely to be mirrored here in Brevard. Business reporter Kilani Best went out to visit one such business, Bravo Supermarket, and here's what she found. This is Kilani Best from Florida Today. We are here in front of Bravo Supermarkets in Palm Bay. Bravo Supermarkets is one of the many Hispanic-owned businesses in Brevard County. The Hispanic population has nearly doubled since the year 2000 in Brevard County. Bravo Supermarkets is just a small microcosm of the growing Hispanic culture here in Brevard. Now let's go inside and see a little bit more of what Bravo has to offer. We're now here inside of the store with the owners of Bravo Supermarkets, Francisco and Denny Peña. Denny, tell me a little bit about the uniqueness of the products you carry and a little bit about the store itself. We have products from Latin American, Jamaica, Haiti. You can find a little bit of everything from, I would say, all over around the Caribbean. So you will find something here that you will find every, everywhere else. And we talked about how the growth in Brevard County for Hispanics has more than doubled within the last eight years. Can you tell me a little bit about how business has been um, since the store opened three years ago? Uh, we, you know, we, every year what we do, we, you know, growing little by little. So like, like compare last year with this year, we're going like 20% more of what we're doing last year. So. so basically business has grown little by little and you've done 20% more even in this economy, which is a great thing. Uh, so tell me a little bit about how you met. Your story is interesting. Um, you actually met in a grocery store when you were both, both working in a grocery store and now you are owning a store together. Actually, we were working together. Um, I was a part-time cashier while I was studying in high school and he was working in an aisle we met, we started dating, and <laughs> we dated for five years, and then we were all working together, and then we got married, um, we started still in the same place, and up to now, we've been married 15 years, and we've been together. <laughs>
And tell me about um, how do you like living in Brevard County? I know that you are originally from the Dominican Republic and um, you lived in New York and now you're here owning the store. Um, how, is, how is life in Brevard County for you? Uh, my wife's I love it. I, I, I enjoy it. I love it really much, especially where I live. I have everything there. So um, everything that we need is right here, you know, all the beaches. It's nice. I, I love living here. It's a nice area. Does it kind of remind you of the Dominican Republic, the slow pace, the weather? It does. It really does. Like when you see the beach and you see, you know, the atmosphere here, it is, it is almost the same, close. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Now that we've taken a little tour of Bravo Supermarkets, which is a testament to the growing Hispanic population in Brevard County, vamanos. Until next time, this is Kilani Best with Florida Today. Thanks for that tour, Kilani. Tonight, the Brevard County School Board is set to vote on whether to raise your property taxes, a move that would bring in almost $9 million and could save hundreds of jobs. What's the cost for taxpayers? Well, for the owners of a home with a taxable value of $200,000, the difference between a yes or a no vote would be about $44 a year. The increase will require a supermajority vote. Four or five members of the board must say yes. The extra tax would last about two years before expiring in November 2010, when voters would have to okay it for it to continue. Earlier this week, education reporter Megan Downs sat down with District Finance Chief Judy Preston to talk about the proposal. Here's that report. Hi, I'm Megan Downs with Cram Session on the Air. I'm here with Judy Preston, Associate Superintendent uh, for Provide Public Schools. She's in charge of financial services. Um, we're here to talk about tonight's board meeting where the board will decide to vote on raising the millage rate by a quarter mil. We just, uh, Judy, if you could explain to our viewers what that means and what that would do for the district um, sure. that's been going through some dire financial times lately, or at least the fear of it. Sure. Um, <laughs> as the legislative session ended, one of the things that the legislature adopted was giving the board the flexibility to levy an additional quarter of a mil. Now, the quarter of a mil could be used for operating or it could be used for capital, but it is at the discretion of the school board. It takes a super majority vote of the school board, which in our case is four of the five must vote in the affirmative. Uh, Dr. Patry talked with the board about this this past week when we had our budget workshop and tried to give them some scenarios in terms of when we do talk about what will have to be cut for the coming year, how this would play an integral piece. Mm -hmm. So we basically laid it out for them without the quarter of a mil and what the budget cuts would be with the quarter of a mil. Mm -hmm. And now this quarter of a mil, it seems like if passed, it would save a lot of jobs. Um, or at least there would be less Absolutely. that were threatened. Uh -huh. Absolutely. The dollar value is $8.3 mm -hmm. Makes quite a bit of difference in terms of the actual recommendations the superintendent made to the school board. And hopefully with the quarter of a mil, uh, we would fall into a scenario where although we would be reducing some positions, uh, hopefully it wouldn't cost us any teachers. Mm -hmm. Now the board has been pretty active, I guess, talking about um, what they thought or how education should be funded. You think it's likely that it will pass tonight? Do they seem poised to pass something like that? I, I'm very hopeful that the board, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of, we have a pro board, uh, pro education board mm -hmm. as the superintendent will say, and I'm, I'm very optimistic that they've looked at that because although I highlighted teachers uh, really were hopeful that under the scenario if they should choose to levy the additional quarter of a mil that what would happen is over the course of the year hopefully we could get through attrition 
all the other positions that we would need to cut mm -hmm. and so that we really wouldn't have any employees that we would have to lay off which right. would be a very good thing if we could get to that point right so, that makes that very attractive right exactly and this is just sort of the start of your budget process it won't be over until September absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely um, we have uh, another major workshop with the board on the uh, 25th at the end of this month or I'm sorry at the end of June mm -hmm. and then we have uh, public hearings both in July and in September but you're right September 3rd is when the final budget hearing is and that's when the budget is officially adopted the um, one other thing though in mm -hmm. that the superintendent is asking the board to take action now mm -hmm. on expressing their wishes about whether or not they would vote for the quarter of a mill mm -hmm. um, people would think well if it's May 26 why is he doing that so far ahead right. but the issue is we've got to actually know what their thought process is mm -hmm. what would they be in favor of doing so that then we can develop the budget based on that scenario mm -hmm. whether it's with the quarter of a mill or without it Okay, so okay. it should be an interesting night. Absolutely. Great. Okay, thanks, Judy. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Again, that vote is tonight. You can see live coverage on our education team's blog, The Cram Session, throughout the evening at floridatoday.com. And finally, it's been a decade in the making, but the International Space Station is shifting its focus to science. The expansive space lab has been under construction since 1998, but this week, the station's population will double to six, and that means more time to spend on science experiments and research. More than 10 years ago, the Russians launched the first piece of the International Space Station. The dreams of the world's spacefaring nations were big. They wanted a first-class laboratory orbiting the Earth, where scientist astronauts from around the world could do experiments not possible on the ground. They aimed to solve problems on Earth and blaze trails for humans to fly deeper into space. But the fulfillment of that dream was slowed by worldwide financial struggles, delays in the construction and launch of station components, and a space shuttle disaster that killed seven astronauts and stopped assembly of the outpost for almost three years. The station could not support more than three residents, just barely enough to keep the spacecraft flying, but not enough to do much science on board. That all changes this week. Three men are set to launch on a Russian rocket from Kazakhstan on Wednesday. On Friday, they'll arrive and double the size of the crew to six. Officials estimate the full-size crew will be able to triple the number of space station work hours devoted to science. As an added symbolic bonus, the crew will feature a representative of all the major partners in the $100 billion space station project. The new arrivals are Roman Romanenko of Russia, Frank DeWin of Belgium, and Robert Thursk of Canada. They joined space station commander Gennady Padalka of Russia, Michael Barrett of the United States, and Koichi Wakata of Japan. The space station is a joint venture of the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, and 11 European nations. The partners have invested tax dollars, engineering expertise, and crew members in the project. The first Russian-built segments launched in 1998. The first crew of three arrived in 2000. Over almost 10 years, spacewalkers from seven nations have spent almost 800 hours constructing a complex that now spans an area as large as an American football field. The last equipment needed to support the six-person crew arrived at the space station via a space shuttle just a couple of months ago. As things stand now, NASA has funding to continue space station operations through at least 2016, but the project's partners are studying how to extend the project through 2020. You'll be able to watch that launch from Kazakhstan, live on floridatoday.com, as well as get updates on our space blog, The Flame Trench. That's our show for this week, everyone. We'll be back every Tuesday with a deeper look into the people, stories, and issues of Brevard County. You'll get a chance to better know our reporters, editors, and photojournalists here at Florida Today as we ask questions of local leaders and take you behind the news. For Today in Brevard, I'm Adam Lowenstein. See you next time.